The Lord saith, I think thoughts of peace and not of affliction. You shall call upon me, and I will hear you, and I will bring back your captivity from all places. Words taken from the introit for today's Holy Mass, the sixth Sunday, it resumed after Epiphany. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. When a jet liner is drawing close to its destination in turbulent and stormy weather, the going can be quite rough. The engines are not steady as the pilot keeps adjusting the plane because of the winds. And the air brakes on the wings go up and down and up and down and the wing flaps are put out making a racket, some strange noises with the thump thump of the landing gear coming down. When the going is really rough, thick clouds, rain and snow and sleet and even lightning all around, everyone quiets down. The uncertainty of the situation crosses people's minds. Some jets have crashed near landing, we think. This is a dangerous moment in the flight. The what-ifs flash across our minds. Am I ready? Does this pilot really have what it takes to land this plane? If you have ever been on a plane where everyone claps and cheers once they land safely, you will know what I'm speaking of. Are we not feeling a similar sort of rumbling in this age? As if it were the end of a rough and stormy epoch. As if we were approaching some difficult landing, but a crash seems more likely. We cannot help but wonder whether the pilot really knows what he is doing or is even aware of the dangers. Maybe the pilot has spoken over the loudspeaker as he is wont to do and says foolish and nonsensical things, causing much concern in the faithful passengers. Some of those serving on board look a little too worried for comfort, while others do not look worried enough. Hmm. As you look around, many are seeking for ways to get out of this rough and stormy vessel. If nothing else, they want, they seem to just wander around from place to place, trying to find some level of peace that continually evades them. Like looking for the pot of gold at the end of a rainbow. Now to avoid taking such an exit ourselves, to avoid jumping off and trying to go it alone, or just wander about wasting our resources, at times like this, we must employ our memory, our memory and solid principles to keep us focused and buckled in our seats. One principle that comes to mind is from the Desert Fathers. It is simply stated as, do not leave your cave. Do not leave your cave. Do not leave your cave. Using our analogy, we could say, do not leave your seat. Many examples from the lives of the saints come to mind, new and old. The Desert Father, Saint Anthony the Great, took up his place in the tombs outside of town. If you know the story, the devils came in force and tried and tried to get him to give up and leave. The battle was fierce so fierce that the demons were even allowed to beat him physically so that so much so that he appeared to be nearly dead when his friends found him fearing for his life they carried him back to town when he awoke he commanded them to take him back to his cave he was so taken to renew the battle after the victory finally against all the world the flesh and the devil was won his majesty came and Anthony complained, where were you, O oh good Jesus? Where were you? Why did you not come sooner to heal my wounds? 
he heard a voice reply, Anthony, I was by your side and wanted to be a spectator in your combat. Since you have resisted so courageously, I will always help you and I will make your name famous throughout the world. Anthony arose, healed immediately to pray and was stronger than before. He stayed the course for a successful landing. As St. Paul indicates in the lesson today, which we just heard, this great saint became a pattern, a pattern of faith, hope, and charity for all who followed him. Soon the desert was populated by monks and monasteries. How about St. John Vianney? the cure of Ars. He comes to mind, what is his cave? The parish of Ars, France, even his confessional. The devil tried and tried, as you know the story, to get him to give up and leave and almost succeeded three times. Over his lifetime tenure there, but the saint came to himself each time and returned to cast out yet more demons in souls living in sin and despair. He became a tree for countless birds to find rest. And now is the patron of parish priests. He had some 80,000 people coming to him a year by the time he died. He was a tree. His body remains incorrupt. Humility can be simply defined as knowing your place and taking your place, knowing your cave and staying in your cave. Knowing your seat, staying there. Don't we have a saying, I was in the right place at the right time. That is what I want for you, dearly beloved, to be in your place, your cave, your seat at the right time according to the plan of God, then no matter how strong the winds and the turbulence, the smog, the fog, the sleet and the snow, no matter how strong they may be, no matter how rough and uncertain the landing, no matter how inept the pilot may be, you will be able to remain firm and souls will be saved. Stay in your cave. Stay in your seat. Stay in the Holy Roman Catholic Church united to the Vicar of Christ. Come what may. The fact of the matter, however, is that whole nations have left their cave. And that is why we feel the storms now and great turbulence around us and even in us. First among these nations, we can name with Our Lady of Fatima, Russia. I propose to you that this is the error of Russia. They left their cave. They left their place. They left their seat. That is the unity with the Holy Roman Catholic Church. They broke unity with the pilot of the ship, not trusting him to land the plane safely. This happened definitively after the fall of Constantinople and the peace offered from the Council of Florence. When did Constantinople fall? 1453 to the Muslims. And then Moscow called itself the Third Rome. They rejected unity with the church. And they went their own way. As this error spread, the whole world is now out of balance. Storms, turbulence are bound causing doubts and fears and concerns, Russia has indeed spread her errors, this being the first. So many today are doing the same thing and unbuckling their belts, jumping out of their seat and leaving Holy Mother Church. And I'm sure you have a list of people that you can name yourself among them. I even know some priests who are. To help grasp what is happening here and what will happen, we need some memory. We need to use our memory. Better yet, to use the memory of Holy Mother Church. And one saint in memory I have in mind is from last week, it comes to our aid. Namely, the 17th century martyr, Saint Josephat. He died in 1623. 
with the help of the Roman breviary and the encyclical letter of Pope Pius XI, issued and promulgated in 1923, on this saint, we learn these basic facts. Saint Josephat. From the breviary, we learn he was a vigorous champion of Catholic unity and truth. He labored to the utmost of his ability to win back schismatics and heretics to unity with the See of Blessed Peter. Both by preaching and writing, he defended the Supreme Pontiff and the doctrine of the Pope's plenitude of power. He won back an incredible number of heretics to the bosom of Holy Mother Church. Roman breviary. It goes on to say, the saintly bishop shed his very blood in order to preserve unity of the Holy Catholic Church. He died in what is now, I believe, the Ukraine. He died at the hands of Russian Orthodox who were trying to prevent reunion with Rome. Pope Pius says this, as a result and almost immediately after his martyrdom, a great number of people, among whom were the very murderers of the saint, returned to the bosom of the unity of the Church of Christ. Thank you, Pope Pius. His body is fittingly resting under one of the altars in St. Peter's Basilica in Rome. What better place could be found for such a great saint? Now the pattern here of St. Josephette is clear. The typology is apparent and is threefold. Number one, the reunification of Russia and all Eastern Orthodox to the See of Blessed Peter is to be accomplished at the level of the bishops. Here we can think of the consecration of Russia by the bishops as by Our Lady. Now everyone knows that Our Lady promised us at Fatima that the errors of Russia would cease, that her immaculate heart would triumph over these errors in the end. Thus, one of the first signs of this victory will be the conversion of Russia to the Holy Roman Catholic Church. They will be united to the Pope. And a further sign of this will be surely that they will pray the rosary and accept it. And they will accept the sacred hearts of Jesus and Mary. These are not accepted today in the East. Hardly anyone, even those united to Rome, pray the rosary or are devoted to the Immaculate Heart of Mary. You'll know when the conversion happens because they'll do it with great joy. That's number one. Reunification is going to happen through the bishops. Number two. As we know well, this will be resisted long and to the point of much blood being shed, as was in the case of St. Josephat. Here we can think not only of the bloody wars and revolutions caused by communism spread worldwide by Russia, but also by the third secret of Fatima, the vision part. That's the only part we really got, which ends thus. Here's how it ends. Other bishops, priests, men, and women religious going up a steep mountain, at the top of which there was a big cross of rough hewn trunks, as of a cork tree with bark. Before reaching there, the Holy Father passed through a big city half in ruins and half trembling with halting step, afflicted with pain and sorrow. He prayed for the souls of the corpses he met on his way. In other words, folks, here it is. This is a rough landing. We're in a rough landing. That's what the secret's telling us. Having reached the top of the mountain on his knees at the foot of the big cross, he was killed by a group of soldiers who fired bullets and arrows at him, his execution style. And in the same way, there died one after another, the other bishops, priests, men and women, religious and various lay people of different ranks and positions. We have yet to see this execution style. In other words, though, the point is simple. Unity at this level is going to require martyrdom. That's seen in the life of St. Josephat. And finally, number three. In the end, there will be a massive conversion, just as there was with St. Josephat. Pope Pius XI comes to my aid. He's prophetic. 
I think he's exercising his prophetic office. Listen to him. The blood of St. Joseph at even today, as it were 300 years ago, is a very special pledge of peace. The seal of unity. We call it a very special pledge for the present times because those unhappy Slavic provinces, torn by disturbances of all kinds and by insurrections, have been empurpled with the blood spilt in the terrible and inhumane wars of our own days. What's he saying? It's a special pledge of peace. We're not wrong in using this memory to prepare ourselves for the future. One more part from, from the third secret. This is the very end. Beneath the two arms of the cross, there were two angels, each with a crystal aspersorium in his hand, in which they gathered up the blood of the martyrs and with it sprinkled the souls that were making their way to God. This blood is going to be used to convert the world. And finally, the Pope predicts, Pope Pius, there shall return to her bosom all those who have separated from her. He used the universal, all. No matter what their motives for doing so may have been, they're going to come back. The time, he says in another place, the time shall come when the promise of Christ as well as the desire of the saints, of all his saints, will be fulfilled. And there will be one fold and one shepherd. Pope Pius, thank you. If we stay in our cave, stay in the seat of our duties of our state in life, keeping on the safety belt of God's commandments, keep to our devotions to the first Fridays and Saturdays, and the bishops unite to consecrate Russia, the error of Russia will come to an end. All those trying to destroy the church will convert. There will be a successful landing, regardless of the pilot. If you don't know, there are planes today that land without the pilot, especially in rough weather. They land the plane successfully without him getting involved hardly. This plane is one of those. It cannot be destroyed or crash in that way due to pilot error. Let us then, dearly beloved, stay in our cave, come what may, and not forget our glorious and helpful past to gain the victory that is promised in the future. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.